Uh, our chat for the Wild uh, Speaker Series is with uh, Ranger uh, Josh Contois. Uh, first, uh, we're going to begin uh, with a video. Uh, on the Desert Re Refuge uh, from Bristol Cone Media. So uh, if you ever visit the uh, Corn Creek Station, this will be uh, very familiar for you uh, as they play it in their visitor center. desert solitude, the echoes of time are carried in the wind. This land is rugged and unforgiving, yet in every corner there exists the delicate and eternal unfolding of growth and rebirth. Here in the Mojave Desert, we see how life flourishes even in the most challenging environments. At nearly 1.6 million acres, the Desert National Wildlife Refuge is the largest refuge in the contiguous United States. Water, its ephemeral presence, and the lack of it is the primary force that shapes the landscape and defines existence. It is scarce, yet the inhabitants of this arid region have found a way to thrive. All right, so I uh, wanted to share that video uh, with you guys, uh, the kind of preface of uh, the talk that we'll have tonight. Uh, with Ranger Josh, so uh, he's going to explain a little bit about the Desert National Wildlife Refuge and also uh, the Recreate Responsibility, uh, excuse me, Recreate Responsibly uh, campaign that they have uh, going on through the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So um, I will go ahead and yield uh, the floor and allow uh, Ranger Josh to take over with his chat. Thank you, Shai. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone in attendance. It was a privilege to be here chatting with everyone tonight. I do appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and let's see, share my screen here. All right. Can we all see that all right? Gotcha. All right. So uh, my name is Ranger Josh Contois. I'm the park ranger for the Desert National Wildlife Refuge. The refuge is an urban refuge. Uh, which is a special distinction, meaning we were uh, close to a, an urban area, and so therefore we have a, a greater population size of um, people who can come out and visit and enjoy the space. Um, and this uh, will be sort of an introduction to the refuge, the area, for those of you who may have not have been, or just maybe it might encourage you to come out and visit. All right. So let's see. There we go. So before we begin, I kind of want to talk a little about Fish and Wildlife Service and who we are, because we are kind of one of those lesser known land management agencies. Um, first thing to know is that we are part of the Department of the Interior. Uh, this is the uh, department that is in charge of all public lands, uh, excluding agriculture, which has the US Forest Service. But within that, you know, uh, there is Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife and Parks who oversees US Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service. So Fish and Wildlife is beneath the Secretary. And then beneath the Fish and Wildlife Service, is the refuge system. This is the actual um, program that manages all of the public lands, the physical lands uh, that we maintain for the various habitat and wildlife. And then within the system is the Desert National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Uh, now we are four refuges located here in Southern Nevada that are managed collectively uh, as a single unit. And those are Desert Refuge, Desert National Wildlife Refuge, Moapa Valley National Wildlife Refuge, Brannigat National Wildlife Refuge, and Ash Meadows National Wildlife. Now, the refuge system is massive. There's actually currently 
567 refuges in the National Wildlife Refuge System, totaling over 95 million acres of land. Uh, these refuges span from Guam to Nevada to Maine, encompassing almost every imaginable habitat, and contributing to about $3.2 billion per year into local economies. Uh, Alaska actually has some of the largest in terms of space, including the um, iconic Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So no matter where you go, where you are, you're never within more than half a day's drive of a wildlife refuge somewhere near you. But luckily we have one in our backyard. Now people often ask us what fish and wildlife does uh, and we do a lot of things. We wear a lot of different hats uh, just like any other land management agency. Um, most folks know us for managing the Endangered Species Act. A lot of people will know for the law enforcement we do. Um, we do things with uh, habitat restoration and ecological services but specifically we're going to be talking about the National Wildlife Refuge System which is where the desert refuge uh, falls under. Now, it all began with this guy, President Theodore Roosevelt. Um, pretty much what had happened was in uh, a little bit of history for us here. Back in 1903, uh, President Theodore Roosevelt established Pelican Island as the first wildlife refuge. Um, at that time, women's hats were very popular and decorated with all kinds of fancy egret feathers and other endangered birds. Uh, and so entire rookeries were just being extirpated for birds for their feathers. And so Theodore Roosevelt, as an avid outdoorsman, wanted to protect these birds. He went to his um, attorney general and said, is there anything preventing me from you know, establishing this as a bird sanctuary? The attorney general said no. And so and Theodore Roosevelt said, it is hereby ordered that Pelican Island and Indian River is hereby reserved and set apart for the use of the Department of Agriculture as a preserve and breeding ground for native birds. And thus, it became the first wildlife refuge before wildlife refuges were even a thing. They hired Paul Krogel as the original game warden slash ranger of the island, and he was paid a dollar a month. They issued him a badge and a gun, and he spent the remainder of his life living on that island or near it, protecting the pelicans and the birds. Uh, anytime someone came over with a, uh, a boat or something to come near, he would show up and shoo them away. He actually tried to put up a sign to, uh, to warn off potential poachers and visitors, but the sign was such an intrusion that the birds wouldn't go near it and hated it, and so actually he removed the sign. Fun little fact there. So that brings us to the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the mission of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is working with others to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitat for the continuing benefit of the American people. Now, our mission is a little bit different than, say, other public land agencies you might be familiar with. Um, so some have multi-use mandates, such as like Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service. Others, such as National Park Service, have more of a preservation uh, mission. Ours is the only agency with a wildlife-centric mission. This means that by default, all the wildlife refuges are closed unless the refuge manager determines it's appropriate to open. Well, what does appropriate mean? Uh, appropriate uh, is defined by the, Public Ref uh, the Refuge Recreation Act of 1962 and identifies six traditional uses uh, that hopefully don't impact the, uh, the refuge purpose of the restoration and the habitat. Uh, and those are wildlife photography and wildlife observation, interpretation and environmental education, and of course, fishing and hunting. And all these together means wildlife refuges are a great place to see wildlife. So let's take a look at the desert refuge. Um, it's our backyard refuge. It's not that far away. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the Desert Refuge is part of a complex here in Southern Nevada of four different wildlife refuges. Uh, and so we are the closest to Las Vegas, but uh, within an hour or so is Ash Meadows. And then if you go north up I-15, you can get to Moapa Valley and then off 93 to the Pranagat National Wildlife Refuge. So the first thing about desert is it was established in 1936 by President Franklin Roosevelt in order to provide habitat for the desert bighorn sheep and other desert wildlife. Uh, to date, it is the largest remaining intact habitat for the species. Uh, it's also the largest refuge outside of Alaska, encompassing about 1.6 million acres. It has six different mountain ranges, that's how large it is, and seven different life zones. So the higher up you drive in the range, uh, it's like traveling through different states. It's really exciting. It's about the equivalent of going like 600 miles north, pretty much. Um, and so the refuge is roughly a 20 minute drive from Las Vegas, uh, going northwest on US 95. Uh, we're open year round, 
Um, and that means you can come out any time of day, any time of year. Uh, many birders are familiar with the Clone Creek Station, uh, which is kind of the gateway towards the Desert Refuge, but there's a lot more to it. So most folks begin at our visitor center. Uh, this is a great spot to pick up maps and brochures, uh, get travel conditions, share wildlife sightings, and uh, you know, browse a well-curated bookstore full of unique gifts. Unfortunately, the visitor has been closed since mid-February due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, beginning in October, We'll be starting an exterior contact station in order to provide some of the same services that we offered pre-COVID. And uh, you know, we're excited and hopefully gonna open the visitor center as soon as we can safely do so. Um, one of the main reasons people come out to the Desert Refuge, especially the Corn Creek area, is that it's a great spot for birding. Corn Creek is an area that is a natural spring. Uh, and so we have a lot of trees and therefore a lot of wildlife. Uh, we receive migratory songbirds throughout the, uh, and shorebirds throughout the year. Uh, with many different nesting species, such as this cooper's hawk. Uh, but if you're not a birder, that's great too. There's a lot of smaller wildlife you can see. Uh, things like insects, lizards, snakes, rabbits. Um, all of these animals are commonly seen in the Corn Creek area, we call the front country, uh, near the visitor center and our trails. Um, in the springtime, the wildflower blooms add a really great color to the otherwise kind of drab landscape. You can see things like the prickly pear cactus, the Mojave asters, the globe mallow, um, just adds a really, burst of color and of course brings out lots of things that enjoy the flowers as well, such as the desert tortoise that enjoys munching on them or several different pollinator species. Uh, springtime at the refuge is a very lively time. Uh, all told, the refuge is home to over 500 species of plant, uh, over 320 species of bird, 52 species of mammal, 32 species of reptile, and a lot more. Now, I mentioned earlier that the refuge was established to help protect the bighorn sheep. Um, so, of course, the bighorn sheep is the state mammal of Nevada, um, and these animals are extremely well adapted to the desert. Uh, they can, in fact, go eight days without drinking water and lose up to 31% of their body mass uh, and then drink it back. What? Sorry, who was that? Okay. I said uh, that the bighorn sheep can drink, uh, go about eight days without drinking and lose up to 31% of their body mass. Um, humans, we would die after losing about 10% of our body mass. So they, they can lose, they, their weight can fluctuate a lot. Um, and then once they get a water source, they can drink up to five gallons of water at a time and replenish that, uh, that deficit. Um, and so in order to help improve this habitat for the desert bighorn sheep, starting back in the 1930s, uh, crews started establishing these cisterns throughout the various mountain ranges called guzzlers. Uh, the cisterns collect rainwater and other precipitation and then provide a source of year-round water for not just the desert bighorn sheep, but other animals as well that you might find out on the refuge. Um, at the time the refuge was established, there was about, you know, 300 sheep or so across the six mountain ranges. Uh, today, we are somewhere between 800 and 1,000 bighorn sheep. Uh, we work with the Nevada Department of Wildlife every year to do aerial surveys and count uh, the sheep, as well as occasional radio collaring uh, and monitoring and tracking where these animals go. Um, they are really iconic creatures, uh, but they're also kind of reclusive creatures. We don't see them all that often. It's pretty lucky when you do see them because they are so shy. Um, so being able to see a bighorn sheep in the wild in the backcountry desert refuge is a really special experience. Uh, another species we have uh, at the refuge, actually this is one that people get to see all the time, is the perump pool fish. These are a, a small fish that was discovered in 19, uh, 1970s in Mant Springs in Nye County uh, near Pahrump. And at the time, the springs was drying up due to excess groundwater pumping. So a few intrepid fish and wildlife biologists went out there and collected every last one of these fish and put them into a refuge population. Um, and since then, their numbers have increased by the thousandfold. Uh, and we actually have a refuge tank out at Corn Creek. So you can come and visit these fish and see them. So functionally, they are extinct from the wild. We have done efforts to reintroduce them uh, to things like the pond at the visitor center at Corn Creek or at Spring Mountain Ranch State Park. Um, but they have to compete with non-native aquarium fish that people jump in the waters, as well as things like bullfrogs uh, and invasive crayfish. But um, these are, we like to get a success story uh, with us. And again, these are right at our trail system. You can come see these. They're about, you know, an inch, two inches long tops. Um, so I said the refuge is home to uh, a vast array of species uh, that are naturally present, as well as a few 
potentially relocated species like the Pahrump Coalfish. Uh, there are a few issues and concerns we do have with the refuge. Um, so obviously I mentioned the invasive species, crayfish, aquatic um, aquarium fish people drop in, uh, but also certain invasive weeds, things like certain tumbleweeds, we get certain thistles uh, that we have to combat uh, pretty regularly. We occasionally do get illegal public use, that's people you know, driving off road or dumping their trash, uh, removing artifacts that are found. Um, sometimes people will dispose of their pets out on the refuge, sadly, that we see that we find that. Uh, we, we try and correct that as best we can through educational contact and, if necessary, law enforcement. Um, obviously, climate change is a huge threat to uh, the conditions at the refuge. Um, as things get hotter and drier for longer, you know, we're seeing changes in hydrology. Those guzzlers that I mentioned earlier that are supposed to provide rainwater and, uh, throughout the year, uh, we find that they're drying up sooner and faster, and it's causing more stress on these sheep. Uh, and so. That is a, a population concern for wildlife managers. Um, there's also, you know, a spread of disease in the bighorn sheep population. We're seeing um, uh, different diseases come through there. And then another issue we're having, especially in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, is an influx of new visitors. Now, I love new visitors. I love people coming out to the refuge. Um, but we are seeing such a, a mass of first-time visitors that it can be almost overwhelming for folks. So to that end, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partnered with several other um, nonprofit agencies and outdoor business partners in order to promote the Recreate Responsibly campaign. Um, and this is basically a campaign designed to remind folks about ethically, uh, ethical ways to behave uh, when you're out on public lands, whether they're national parks or national wildlife refuges or out on the BLM. Uh, this, is, this is a good across the board way of thinking for when visiting these public places. Um, and so, you know, what does it mean to recreate responsibly at the Desert Refuge? Well, first things first, you want to explore locally. And luckily, Desert Refuge is right in your backyard. We are 20 minutes away from Vegas. Anyone can come see us anytime they like. Um, but most other refuges are only within an hour to drive from most urban areas uh, and major cities and towns. So it's not that far to get to a wildlife refuge wherever you are. Um, so here in Vegas, it does mean Desert Refuge, but it can also mean Ash Meadows or Paranagat, uh, Urban Whopper Valley. They're not that far. Um, they're all within a couple hours drive. Second is to know before you go. Um, and this means checking websites, calling ahead, or looking at social media before you visit. Um, this gets you the latest information on services, crowds, and closures. Uh, if it's crowded, have a backup plan. Uh, I mean, how many of us who live here in Las Vegas ever got up to Mount Charleston only to find out there was no place to park or the trailheads were full or, you know, it just, it was stressful because there's too many people. It's the same with the refuges. You know, you can always call and find out what the crowds are like, but luckily Desert Refuge is never that crowded. Um, there's a lot of public land in Southern Nevada, so there's no shortage of places uh, to spend time outdoors. And at 1.6 million acres, it's really easy to disperse out at the Desert Refuge. Uh, third thing, of course, to know about responsible recreation is, uh, you know, keeping a safe distance. Uh, you want to maintain at least six feet of distance on the trail um, while fishing, uh, like if you're at Paranagat or Ash Meadows, or in a parking lot. Um, this is just to help maintain that, that social distancing and safety net for all of us. Um, if a trail appears crowded, you know, you can always choose an alternative trail, or if it's a loop, go a different route, a uh, different direction. Nothing wrong with that. Um, it's also worth remind reminding folks to practice good personal hygiene. Um, we do have restrooms open 24-7 uh, at the Visitor Center, so anyone traveling the backcountry, um, or sorry, excuse me, so at the Visitor Center, anyone can come in and, and wash their hands, use the facilities, uh, and they are clean and sanitized daily. Um, and then anyone who travel, planning on traveling into the backcountry should bring their own sanitizer and toilet paper. There is a restroom facility up at the Desert Pass campground, uh, but it is, it is cleaned regularly, but it is not stocked regularly, so it's always good to have your own supply with that. Um, last, you really want to practice leave no trace principles when visiting the refuge or any public land really. Uh, now leave no trace can mean many things, but specifically it can mean take your trash home with you. You know, we do see a lot of people living, leaving things behind. Um, just because you think something might be useful to someone in the future is not a valid reason to leave something in the back country. Um, so we've had issues of folks leaving things like uh, half-empty fuel canisters or odd lengths of rope or tarps, um, cans of soup. You might think you're doing a nice thing. You're just creating litter. 
Um, similarly, I know we, some people like to paint those, those rocks. That's graffiti. Please do not leave your painted rocks at the refuge. Um, and, uh, you know, leaving a trace also means knowing your limits. It, it's hot in the Mojave Desert. Um, you want to make sure that you know how your physical capability is as far as hiking and exploring. And you want to bring enough food and water with you to be able to comfortably explore whenever it is you do go outside and come visit us at the refuge. Um, so just a few other things. So the refuge is open 24-7 uh, and camping is allowed. You're welcome to come out and disperse camp anywhere you'd like. Um, as long as you're within 100 feet of a road, uh, if you're driving a vehicle not parked um, off-road in established areas, there's the Desert Pass Campground. There's six sites up there, uh, some vault toilets, and it's about 20 miles in the, the Mormon Mill Road. It's a really great spot to visit. It's about 7,000 feet elevation, so you get nice and high and cool and can escape some of that heat, especially during the summer. But you do need a four-wheel drive or high-clearance vehicle in order to get there. Um, but you can backpack pretty much anywhere you'd like out there and disperse camp. Just know that no fires are uh, permitted, especially now during uh, high fire season um, here in the, the Southern Nevada area. Uh, normally said so the visitor center is open, but unfortunately due to COVID it is closed. However, you're always welcome to call. There should be someone there most days and able to answer your questions, or you can find us on Facebook and ask your questions through there and someone will get back to you uh, right away. But the whole refuge um, is just ton, you know, dozens of miles of trails and roads. Uh, you know, we have a lot of human history there from the historic railroad tie cabin at Corn Creek uh, to the Whispering Bend mortars out there. We have the uh, Hidden Forest cabin, there's petroglyphs, there's a lot of human history. Um, you can drive the Alamo Road all the way through to Paranagat from Desert. That's about a four or five hour drive. Again, you'll need a high clearance or four wheel drive vehicle. Uh, and definitely check the road conditions before you go because a dry lake bed out there gets very silty and sandy and difficult to pass. Uh, and so you need to be an experienced four wheel driver to get across that. Um, but we are open year round and we um, normally host a range of interpretive programming. Uh, all of our programming usually advertised through our website or through our Facebook page. And um, as you travel refuge, you know, you'll see a whole diversity of life through those seven life zones. Um, and each turn of the road or trail lead you to spectacular views in the backcountry and a really great time. So that's my spiel and I will turn it over now to Shai for some Q&A, I guess. Right, yeah. Um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and ask your question about the um, presentation we just received. Um, also, uh, feel free to type in your questions on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, so chat, Facebook, or go live if you like. And now um, I do have a question uh, as far as um, National Wildlife Refuge Week. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming up the 11th through the 17th. Uh, do you have anything planned uh, for that? Absolutely, great question. Thank you, Shai. Uh, we do. Uh, so uh, starting on Sunday the 11th, uh, we're partnering with the Red Rock Audubon Society in order to provide a Birding 101 virtual program. And so we're gonna be teaching folks how to use binoculars, the ethics of birding and what to look for when they're, they're starting out birding. Uh, later in the week, we're gonna be doing some Ask a Ranger series, part of our, our creature features. So we'll be partnering with uh, the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Get Outdoors Nevada to highlight some of the local species we have in the area. So we'll, things like uh, native snakes, we will be doing a Gila monster special uh, featuring the desert tortoise. And we're also on a, the last day, the 17th, gonna have two events. The first event is going to be a creature feature with uh, some local falconers to meet some local falcons, uh, things like the peregrine falcon and the kestrel, and we're up close and personal with them. And then also, if you have any kids in the area or families, you want to come out and look for something to do, you can stop by the Corn Creek Visitor Center. We're going to be offering our Junior Ranger workbook for folks to come out and do, and they can uh, anyone can participate in that and earn their Junior Ranger badge once it's complete. And Puddles the Blue Goose, the mascot of the National Wildlife Refuge System, We'll be out there as well, offering uh, congratulations and welcomes to everyone who comes out to visit. So we have a full week planned for National Wildlife Refuge Week coming up in just a couple of weeks. Awesome. And um, everything will be uh, filtered through the Desert National Wildlife Refuge's uh, Facebook page. So mm -hmm. make sure you're following them on Facebook for sure. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. That is kind of our, our primary mode of 
of advertising. Um, I find it easier for folks to log into their own social media than to try and ask them to download one of these third party teleconference platforms. Um, so uh, I received a question, where do you put the sheep at night? Um, the, the sheep, they, you know, will sleep wherever they feel most comfortable. Um, you know, they have different herd sizes and they will often, especially during the day, find some place like a shady rock outcropping uh, or a cave or some other area where they can escape the heat of the day. And um, I see another question in the chat. Uh, there seems to be limited options for parking in regard to camping uh, out on a refuge. Mm -hmm. Am I missing some options or is there indeed limited uh, to the few parking pullouts that they find? So Jenny, uh, thank you for asking that question. It depends on where you're going. So at the visitor center, we have 30 or so spaces, uh, maybe 40, I forget exactly the number, uh, that are at our paved area at our visitor center. Uh, as far as traveling in the back country, the pullouts are fewer and far between. Um, you'll notice a few of them along the Alamo Road as you head north um, towards Paranagate. They do get more dispersed as you drive out. Uh, and then as you go across the Mormon Mill Road towards Highway 93, um, we have a few along Gas Peak Road, we have a few up in the Pine Nut, and then of course there's the water pullouts along the campgrounds. Um, generally, we don't have a super high visitation that requires needing more pullouts than that. Um, however, we, I do know that the, uh, the Jeep caravans are a very popular activity out in the refuge. We get different Jeep clubs that'll come out and drive 20 or 30 deep and they will you know drive across the road and so if folks are trying to uh you know do those kind of caravans it can definitely be difficult to find parking for all of those vehicles um the big concern especially with our roads is that in some cases they're functionally a, um, a one-lane road and you do have to kind of maneuver to allow other cars to pass which is why it's important to maintain uh safe speed limits while out on the refuge um you know, 25 miles an hour is recommended. Anything more than that, you risk damaging and puncturing your tires. Um, and also makes it difficult to brake. I saw a video last year of a gentleman riding a motorcycle who almost got run over when he ran into uh, someone's truck. So it is, uh, wow. I see you again. <laughs> it, 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 it can be, uh, you know, you gotta be careful and aware when you're traveling in the backcountry. Uh, hopefully, Jenny, that answered your, your question for you. And um, Stephanie is asking, uh, can you explain diverse, uh, disperse camping a little more? I have a truck camper. Absolutely. Um, so I use the term dispersed camping to differentiate from car camping um, when I, or, or boondocking. I know a lot of folks will take their truck camper or their tow behind camper and they'll pull it up to say the end of Joe May Road or up towards Gas Peak Road. There are some really wide areas that if you have solid tires and a good suspension you can pull your truck camper back to you know three four five miles in there and still get a pretty remote wilderness experience um dispersed camping i refer more to analogous with with backpacking um pretty much packing everything you can into your backpack and say hiking up to the hidden forest cabin and disperse camping up there so that you just you know bring what you need with you and take it back with you when you're done and really leave no trace um hope that uh answers the difference between what i you know define dispersed camping. And um, if, if you are uh, camping in a truck, what are, what are the rules there for, for where you can go on a refuge? So the only actual established campground is our Desert Pass campground up Mormon Well Road. It's about 20 miles up. Um, and that has picnic tables, it has fire rings, it has the vault toilets. Um, if you're looking for more of a rugged experience but still somewhat developed, that is the place for you. Um, if you just want to boondock or, um, you know, car camp, you can park your vehicle at any one of those kind of established pullouts uh, that people have created over the years and just set up shop there. Uh, again, I remind folks that we are under fire restriction and no uh, fires are allowed at this time. When yeah. those fire restrictions are lifted, you need to bring your own wood. There's no collecting or harvesting of any wood on the refuge and any wood you do bring needs to be treated for um, invasive insects because we are starting to see certain um, pine beetles pop up in our pinion and juniper trees. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another question, uh, Leah. Uh, up here in Alaska, we have doll sheep. They never come down out of the mountains. 
Uh, do bighorn sheep there travel into lower elevations or do they also stay in those higher, cooler mountains like sheep here? Great question, Leah, thank you. Uh, it depends on the, the time of year. Uh, during the summer months, unlikely to them come low. Um, however, during the cooler months, you know, the highs might be in the 60s or 70s, they're much more likely to come down, especially if it's uh, cold or snowy up top of the mountains, uh, if they're in search of water. Um, the Corn Creek, we're about 2,900 feet. So um, to my knowledge, I've not seen one there yet. That's not to say that we couldn't see one there. But at our sister refuge, Ash Meadow, especially at the Pointer Rocks area, uh, they come down pretty regularly in order uh, to traverse that area. And it's about the same elevation, about 3,000 feet or so. So it just depends on where you are and if you're lucky. Um, I've gotten reports of folks that have been on the opposite side of the refuge of Mormon Well Road exiting by the Highway 93 and have seen uh, sheep on that side. So I think part of the reason we don't see them at the, the main visitor center area in the front country is just because of the noise and the development. Um, and we are pretty far set back from the, uh, the foothills of the mountain. They would have to you know, travel quite a ways uh, through that saltbush community to get to us and our water source. So um, they definitely come down, but we just don't see them much at our area by the visitor center. Um, and then uh, Fred, how you doing Fred? Um, he's asking, uh, has it been crowded this year? Uh, do, during the pandemic, uh, particularly uh, the Hidden Forest Cabin and Desert Pass, have you been seeing larger crowds? Initially, when, when the COVID pandemic first began um, and, you know, the initial uh, guidance was to, you know, go out and spend time outdoors, we saw a huge influx of wow. people, more than I've ever seen, um, just driving across the road, uh, parking lots were full, Campground was full, uh, especially like around the Easter holiday. Yeah. We had folks we had folks parked off road up there. We had people creating their own little areas and areas that should have been parked. So it was just a lot of use. Um, the Hidden Forest Cabin was similar. That's more difficult to get to for folks that aren't familiar with the Hidden Forest Cabin. It's about five and a half miles up uh, a wash through a canyon, and uh, it's a fairly steep, strenuous hike. But when you get back there, there's an old cabin. Uh, that was built by uh, an early homesteader. And it makes a wonderful spot for an overnight uh, camping trip or a great base camp for anyone who wants to ascend to the top of Hayford Peak. Um, and we, once the refuge was closed by our regional office and the national office, um, we did start doing an assessment uh, of all that impact. And we uh, removed hundreds of pounds of trash from the refuge. Um, since we have reopened, um, you know, it was during the summer months, it was June and July, it was pretty hot. We didn't see any larger than normal visitation. And then now that it's starting to cool off again, we're starting to see our typical fall increase in visitation. Uh, and I, I expect to see us pretty busy through probably in the May from here on out. Um, I'd have to wait till I see the actual numbers to compare. Um, to that. Yeah. Definitely. Um, heading back to uh, Facebook, um, Krista said, please talk about campfires and the importance of putting them out before we leave. I know we touched on that, but I, yes. I don't think we can, can reiterate uh, fire safety, especially in a, a, a year like we've had. So, Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, proper leave no trace with fires is, um, you know, if you're going to create a fire, for example, up in the, the Desert Pass campground, it needs to be cold before you go. So that means... Uh, bringing enough water, not only for you to, to drink and consume, but also having enough water to douse that fire. Uh, and that's enough to like pour the water in, stir it, should be cold to the touch before you leave. Because even an errant fire that's left unattended uh, can cause a spark, which can cause a wildfire. And we have had wildfires out in the sheep range in the past. Um, and we had the one up at um, up uh, Lee Canyon earlier this summer that was caused by uh, an illegal ground fire. So. Uh, you know, important fire safety, definitely. That's why we still remain under fire restrictions right now, and no fires are currently per, uh, permitted anywhere, including at the campground. And then also from uh, Chris on Facebook, are bobcats hunted uh, in this area? Uh, California just got rid of hunting them, so. No, the only hunting that is permissible on the refuge is for the desert bighorn sheep during the bighorn sheep season, and that is roughly December into January. Um, you have to check the Nevada Department of Wildlife for the specific rules and regulations. Those tags are drawn on a lottery system, 
And so some folks have gone 10 years or more without drawing a tag. Uh, I know when people do draw a sheep tag, they're really excited for that. Um, and what's amazing too about the, the hunting season is it is the one time of year when the western portion of the refuge, which is normally uh, shared in a joint jurisdiction with the, the Air Force, the National Test Training Range, is open to public access. So hunters can go out and um, access those other ranges and, and get some, do some pretty successful hunts out there. And what about throughout uh, the rest of the uh, complex? Is there any other hunting uh, allowed? Absolutely. So uh, waterfowl and I think doves just opened up at uh, Ash Meadows. So if you're interested in hunting waterfowl, you can go out to Ash Meadows. Um, and then starting on the 17th, I believe, at Paranagate, the waterfowl season will open there. So, um, you know, if mallards or other waterfowl are your um, hunting forte, that's a great spot to do it. Um, Paranagate's also a great spot to go fishing. We host the Carp Rodeo out there every year in April. Uh, it's a free fishing event. Where you, all you need is your fishing license. You can come out and catch as many of these big Asiatic carp as you want. We have all kinds of awards and prizes from the biggest to the shortest to the fattest. Uh, there's adults and a juniors division. Uh, we usually provide food and lunch. Uh, and so it's, it's a really great day, uh, you know, great time to get out of the city and uh, test your angling skills. All right. And um, I see we have a last uh, comment from uh, Jenny. Uh, she says, I'd like to thank the ranger for his work on a refuge. Uh, thank you for speaking to us, but most especially for the important job that you do. So, thank you, Jenny. I very appreciate that. Yes, she definitely speaks on behalf of all of us uh, in saying thank you. So uh, does anyone else have any uh, final questions for the ranger uh, before we uh, let him go for the evening? And I'm scrolling uh, through here on Facebook to make sure I don't miss anybody. Like St Stephanie asked, are bugs an issue at Perenity? Um, I will admit, I don't know the answer to that one, Stephanie. Um, while I am the ranger for all four refuges, I do spend a majority of my time at the Desert Refuge. Um, I'm not certain. I know that they have been having issues with uh, invasive weeds recently, certain knapweeds especially, uh, and phragmites, which is type of invasive grass. Uh, but I'm not certain about the insects. Thank you. And yeah, it looks like uh, Facebook is satisfied. Oh, okay. You see the uh, message from Stephanie. Yes, yeah, so uh, post about mm -hmm. uh, the bugs. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and Prana gets another great refuge where you can go camping as well. There's a campground there. Uh, I think there's 20 or some odd sites. You can, you know, it's RV friendly. It's right on the lake. Um, so if you're traveling north to Alamo or Great Basin or Ely, that's a great stopover in order to spend the night and great stargazing out there. Yeah. And then if we're going to get in the um, winter, we see all kinds of eagles out there. So if ever you wanted to see golden eagles or bald eagles, Brannigan is a great spot to see both of them. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, we have camped several times during our turn of spring break. Uh, event out there at the uh, Upper Paranagate Lake, and uh, the first time we went, uh, we saw pelicans, and I was I was surprised. That was the first time I've ever seen <laughs> pelicans in the desert. So, uh, awesome time up there. So, uh, I I, my first time at Paranagate, I think I saw one of every type of bird of prey in the same day. Like I saw an owl, an eagle, a hawk, an osprey, a kite. A falcon. I mean, just like one of each. It was just like a checklist. I mean, it's a bird of paradise <laughs> to go up there. Oh, man. That's yeah. awesome. Um, I, I would like to mention too that yeah. um, if anyone is interested, you know, we are uh, typically always recruiting volunteers to come out to the refuge. Um, again, 2020 has been a stressful, difficult year for everybody um, for multiple reasons. But normally, we offer a wide range of volunteer opportunities from people staffing the visit center desk or offering, excuse me, interpretive programs. We have volunteers who assist with maintenance. Uh, we have volunteers who work specifically with our biologists on biology related projects. Um, and, you know, depending, we also sometimes have, you know, special event days uh, where people can come out and do things like, uh, we just passed public lands day. Uh, we usually have big trail work days or, yeah. um, um, and, you know, depending, we also sometimes have, that's feedback. Uh, so just to say, if you're ever interested in volunteering 
with Fish and Wildlife or with the Desert Refuge uh, or just want to know more about the Refuge or the Fish and Wildlife Service, feel free to give me an email or a call uh, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. All right, awesome. So uh, on that note, we'll close it out uh, for the evening. So uh, thank you guys for uh, showing up to the October Wild Speaker Series. Thank you, Ranger Josh. Um, keep in mind your Nevada National Wildlife Refuges uh, because National Wildlife Refuge Week is approaching. And also I hope to see you guys soon at the Wild and Scenic Film Festival online. Have a great evening. Bye, everybody. Thanks for attending.